Um, well, good morning. Glad you're here today. How many of you were at Wednesday night uh, this last Wednesday at our Wednesday night fellowship? Okay. Um, I want to talk to just you, y'all, just for a little bit. Um, I I'm, I'm want to apologize to you because if you were there on Wednesday night, I, I just, I, I had a blast on Wednesday night. That worship was amazing. Uh, the, the teaching time was just powerful for me and our discussion and our prayer time. And uh, I, I had a few people this week ask me about it and, and say, are you going to do that on Sunday? And my initial answer was, no, if they weren't here, they missed it. Um, but the more I prayed about this Sunday, the more I realized, I, I think we need that for today. Uh, for today's message. So if you were with us on Wednesday night, we're on the same thing that I taught on Wednesday. And uh, I apologize if you're like, oh, great. It's like leftovers. Um, you know, uh, you know I, I apologize for that. For the rest of you, maybe that's a plug for a Wednesday night. Oh, man, it was awesome. I, I've just enjoyed the last couple weeks. Uh, you know, two Wednesdays ago, we all took communion together and just our prayer times have been great. But what I want to address with you tonight is something that I think is very timely. Did I say tonight? What I want to address with you um, today <laughs> is very timely, and uh, I think it'll have an impact on our church as a whole. Um, I have three daughters, and uh, I, I, you know, thought I was a good dad and had that imagery blown up one day. Um, my brother and sister-in-law at their house, they have a pool, okay? And uh, I, I love when it's hot going to their pool. But when my daughters were little, there was this one summer where there was a heat wave and we were going there several days in a row. My youngest daughter, Anna, uh, didn't know how to swim and we were trying to teach her. But my frustration was this. She wouldn't let dad teach her how to swim she would only let Auntie Sherry teach her how to swim, right? And I, I was getting to the point where I'm like, man, why won't she come to me? She only goes to Auntie Sherry. What's the deal? And uh, one day I'm standing in the pool, and Anna is on the side of the pool, and I'm saying, Anna, come here. Come here. Jump in. I'll catch you. Let's do this. And she was just like, no, no, you know, and, and just she would not do it whatsoever. And finally, I just said, Anna... Have I ever told you I would catch you, but instead just let you fall? And at that moment, not just Anna, but all three of my daughters in stereo said, yes. <laughs> and I just, it was like this moment where I just realized I'm not as good of a dad as I thought I was. And I, for me, I don't, I don't, even to this day, I can't remember the times that I told them I would catch them and then drop them. I mean, I remember other times, like times I accidentally hit them with shovels or uh, vacuum cleaners or, um, you know, chased them around with scary masks or threw worms on them and made them cry. But I can't remember that specific uh, black mark on my fatherhood, right? Um, but the reality is, there was something in my relationship with my daughter, Anna, in that moment where she did not trust me. I don't know if it was based on my character, if it was based on her looking at a, a, a body of water that to uh, you know, a three-year-old is immense. I, I don't know what it was, but at that moment, she did not trust me. And if we're honest today, if I did the same thing with you today, and we were in the pool, and I was like, jump in, I'll catch you. Hardly any of you would trust me in that scenario, right? Trust is something that, for me, over the last several years, I have worked on a lot. We often say that trust is something that has to be earned, but that's not actually scriptural. According to the Bible, trust is something that is given. Sometimes it's easier to give trust, and sometimes it's more difficult. But trust isn't necessarily earned. It's something you give. Uh, what's my basis for that? Go read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where Paul says, love always trusts. Wow. 
the reality is there is a very scriptural, a very spiritual word that is a synonym for trust, and that word is faith. That word's faith. And that's what I want to focus in on today because, quite frankly, I don't have quite as much faith as I would like to have. And there's a story here in Genesis chapter 15 that deals with that topic. I'm going to just do a running commentary through this today. And uh, if you want to follow along, you can turn in your Bibles to Genesis 15, where you'll be able to highlight. And uh, literally, I'm going to focus in on the verses here in this chapter that, from my own devotion, I highlighted. It's just, just the Scripture, and I highlighted certain passages that just stuck out and had an effect on me this past week. Um, it'll also be on the screen if you don't have a Bible, um, but please don't highlight on that. Um, here we are, Genesis chapter 15, starting at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to Abram. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Abram, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Um, let's stop there before we continue with this story. But I want to point out something right at the beginning of this story. In the very first verse, kind of out of the blue, the Lord speaks to Abram with the message, fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. Now what is this in context with? The first verse does start out saying, after these things, meaning that in a chronological order, verse, uh, chapter 15 comes after chapter 14. Now, that seems obvious, but in reality, a lot of times the narrative of the Bibles aren't in chronological order. And, and we can see, um, especially like if you look at the Gospels, that the writers actually jump around in, in the events, and that's why they seem out of order. Even in Genesis, that happens sometimes, where we get a, a bigger picture and it moves forward and then you back up. What the author of Genesis is letting us know is that this is taking place chronologically on a timeline after the events of chapter 14. We don't know how long, though. It could be the next day. It could be the next week. It could be six months after this, because the story of Abram in Genesis is covering decades. What we do know is previous to this, there had been a battle that took place, four kings against five kings. In fact, uh, Genesis 14, you could just call the, the chapter of kings, four kings against five kings. Um, there was a victor in the battle, and in the process, the victors kidnapped Abram's nephew Lot and ran away with him. So what did Abram do? He got together with 300 of the fighting men from his household. He went after these foreign kings and he beat them. Abram took them out. He got Lot back. He got all their possessions back and, and came back. And there's this interaction that takes place in the previous chapter where Abram has to make a choice, do I honor Melchizedek, who is not only a king, but also a high priest for God, or do I honor the king of Sodom? And Abraham makes a decision, I will honor and tithe to the king of Melchizedek, and I will have nothing to do 
with the king of Sodom. So it's, there's in context, it's relating back to that, but probably not fully. This is what we do know about chapter 15, is that as it starts out, there is fear inside of Abraham. There's fear there. Now, when we look at that and we consider faith, we usually think of the opposite of faith being fear. And what we have in this section we just read is it starts out with God having to encourage Abraham, you don't need to be fearful. Now, let me ask you this. Does God rebuke him for it? No. He doesn't rebuke him at all. He doesn't start out and say, Abram, I've done so much for you already. Can you just trust me? I mean, come on, man. Oh, I just sounded like Joe Biden when I said that, didn't I? <laughs> Delete that part out, okay? <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't say anything like that. Instead, God knows the fear that is inside of Abram, and he's coming to him, and he's just saying, Abram, you don't need to be afraid. I am your shield. I will protect you. I'm your shield, and I'm your reward. Don't look at the riches and the wealth that the king of Sodom has and all these other people. I am your reward. You will find all your riches and treasures in me. And I just want to say that to us today. If there is anybody here where in your life there is fear about something going on, note that he is our shield. He is our reward. He is your shield. He is your reward. God comes to Abram, and, and you find that inside Abram's being torn up because literally he's not so much concerned with Sodom and Gomorrah and this other stuff. He's looking at his own household, and he's like, I, I don't have a child. I don't have a son. My wife and I, we're, we're, we're getting older, and this isn't going to happen, and, and I don't know what to do because everything I have will just go to my servant. And what an incredible, encouraging word of prophecy from God. Hey, Abram, look up. See all those stars up there? Could you possibly count them? Well, that's what your offspring will be like. Isn't that awesome? While Abram's in a, 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 a time of fear, he's in a time of, of doubt, uh, God looks at him and says, uh, quit looking down, look up, see all that? I'm going to do something like that through you and your wife. And at the end here, verse 6, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So far as we've read Genesis, uh, we look at this, and we've seen some bad things that Abram has done. There's been times when he hasn't trusted the Lord, times when he's taken things into his own hands. We've also seen that Abram is a man of worship, sacrifice, and repentance. And everywhere he goes and sets up his tent, he builds altars to the Lord. But it wasn't the things he did that made him righteous. It was the one he believed that made him righteous. Isn't that incredible? We so much are, are people that are about performance, and I get it. I get it. I mean, how do we grade ourselves? Growing up in school, uh, we were all graded on performance, right? Um, you know, the, one of the weirdest things, when I moved up here from California, sorry, yes, I confess that. Um, uh, when I moved up here from California to uh, Canby, Oregon, and started going to Eccles School, one of the first things I had to do there was take a Snoopy test. 
Well, what's a Snoopy test? We didn't do Snoopy tests down there, but we all got these cards, and uh, it was in gym class, and they were, you know, physical education cards, and we had to do these different things, and we got stars on our cards. How many of you had a Snoopy test? All right, a few of us, okay. Gen X, uh, yeah, it's the Snoopy test, and, and we, we get these stars based on our performance, and that was just uh, weird to me. But coming in, being brand new in the school district and having to do things like, uh, you know, push-ups, pull-ups, running, I, I could see right away what I was good at and what I was not good at. Like, at that time, running, I was really good at it. Like, I beat everybody else in the class, right? And, uh, and instantly, it's like, oh, little Timmy Davis, the new kid from California, can run faster, yay! Uh, but man, I could not do as many pull-ups, right? And, and you, you, you get graded on it. Going through, you get graded uh, on your tests, on your reading, your writing, your math. And even as adults, we go into college, and you get into colleges a lot of times based on your performance, your job, you get raises based on your performance. And isn't it crazy that that's not how God operates? Our righteousness does not come from our performance. It comes from our faith in Him. That's why the writer of Hebrews takes Abram's story with several others from the Old Testament, and he makes it very clear that without faith, it is impossible to please God. It doesn't matter how well you discipline yourself. It doesn't matter how well you beat your body into submission. If it is without faith, it doesn't please God at all, at all. Righteousness came from his faith in the promises of God. And that's just incredible. In this one paragraph, we see Abram move from fear to faith, from fear to righteousness. The story goes on. And Abram said to the Lord, or, and the Lord said to Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But, if you're highlighting, highlight that word, but, but Abram said, O oh Lord, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Sounds a lot like the 12 days of Christmas, doesn't it? And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. So I look at that paragraph. I highlighted verse 8. We just read that Abram went from fear to faith, from fear to righteousness. Two verses later, God gives Abram a promise, and what does Abram say? Uh, Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? In studying this chapter, it's almost comical to see how most commentators try to explain this one away, because what just happened is you have Abram the father of faith, God makes one declaration to him and he says, I trust you. God makes one more declaration to him and he says, I don't see how that's going to happen. I don't see that's going to happen. You're going to need to prove it to me in some way. That doesn't look like faith to me. That's doubt right there. He's literally saying, I mean, how are you going to do this, Lord? Lord, which tells us this, God can handle our doubts. God can totally handle our doubts, and all of us doubt at different times. 
I mean, you're hearing me today stand up here as I'm talking about what God's doing in our church, and I'm seeing all of this fruit take place and all these great things, and yet at the same time inside of me is like, I don't know how that's going to happen, right? And the reality is you're probably in the same place somewhere in your life, somewhere in your life. You might have a marriage, a child, a job, uh, let's see, what week is it? Oh, your taxes, uh, you know, the economy, the politics that are going on around us, uh, something in your life that you're looking at and you have already seen how God has been there over and over and over in all of these other areas, but there's that one area where you look at it and you're like, I don't, I don't see how this is possible. What's the Lord going to do with this? God, How? How? You know, uh, I'm reminded, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, <laughs> I laugh every time I say that um, because it was Christy Emerson who pointed out to me, do you realize how many favorite stories in the Bible you have? <laughs> I, I guess I say that a lot. But you look at Mark chapter 9, and Mark chapter 9 is incredible because it starts out with the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Like, how many, how many would love to see that, Right? You look at it, and he goes up a mount. He has three of his disciples with him, and, and all of a sudden, you know, they're making camp, and they look up, and Jesus is glowing really bright, and, and uh, you know, Elijah and Moses are there with them, and, and they're like, oh, this is awesome. This is an incredible scene. And then they come down the hill, and the next big interaction we have is the disciples trying to cast a demon out of a young boy. That's uh, kind of something big there, and what happens is they're not able to do it. They've already gone out two by two throughout the land, and they've been healing people. They've been casting out demons, but the, here they are with this little boy, and, and they just can't seem to do it. So let me just read this really quick. Uh, this is Mark 9. It's not up on the screen, but if you, you can follow if you have your, your phone with you or something says this, and when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about? And someone from the crowd answered, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able to. You go down, you find out that this has been happening to this, this son since he was a little child. Since he was a little child. And what you see is an amazing, amazing admittance on the part of the father. Jesus asks him, do you believe and in verse 24, it says, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. is that awesome? I mean, that's, that's just right there, authenticity. The father believed enough to bring his child to Jesus' disciples, but when they're there, Right in the moment, he's struggling with doubt, with fear. It's all right there. He's watching what's happening with his son, convulsing, foaming at the mouth, uh, demon-possessed. And he is honest enough to look at Jesus and say, I believe, but Lord, will you help me with my unbelief? And Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Jesus just heals the boy. All of us doubt at different times. It's just the way it is. And God is big enough to handle our doubts. Now, you look at this and we're saying, yeah, but uh, we're, we're, we're saved by faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. But yet we're looking at all these question marks of doubt. Well, the question becomes, how big of a faith do you need in God? How big does your faith need to be? And Jesus answered that for us. The size of a mustard seed. Itty little bitty faith. 
So often in my life, I pray, Lord, increase my faith. Lord, give me more faith. But in reality, Jesus says all it takes is faith the size of a mustard seed. Why? How does that work? Years ago, I got to hear Jill Briscoe speak, and Jill Briscoe explained it this way. She said, it's not the size of your faith or trust that matters. It's the strength or quality of the person or thing you put your faith and trust in. For instance, if it was wintertime and you walked up to a pond that had ice over the top of it, you could look at that ice and declare to everybody, that pond is frozen, I'm going to walk all the way across the pond, and it will be okay. You could declare it boldly, but if that ice is only a half inch thick, you're going to fall right through. But if someone came to you and said, step out on the ice, come, it's safe, and you with fear and trembling stepped out there and started walking on it, having very little faith, having very little trust, but the ice was five feet thick, it doesn't matter how much fear and trembling you have in taking those steps because the ice will hold you. It's not the size of our faith that matters. It's the one we put our faith in. And so we have Abram here, who is a man who his faith is credited as righteousness, and yet there is still a struggle within him to believe. Verse 12, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Brothers and sisters, there are times when Christians get anxiety, fear, and depression. And that is okay. That is okay. This is what's going on with him. It's, it's this, this darkness that covers him, and there will be times in our life where even though up here we know God is there, right here it doesn't seem like a reality to us. And that's what is happening with Abram. Verse 13, then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried in a good old age of 175 and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed through these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. What just happened? God made a blood covenant with Abram. It was something that they did uh, in that day to make a legal binding agreement with somebody. They would take animals, cut them in half, and the two parties that were making a treaty or an agreement together would like hold hands and walk through the middle of these carcasses. Two things about that. One, that agreement was binding as long as both people were still living. Two, walking through the carcasses, what they were saying is, if I break the covenant, this is what you get to do to me tear me in half. So Abram is told by God, hey, I'm going to make it known to you. You're questioning, you're wondering how I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make a blood covenant with you. But before Abram has the chance to walk through and make the covenant, God 
puts him to sleep. God puts him to sleep. So it is not Abram making a covenant with God. It is our eternal God making a covenant with Abram. So that means this covenant is eternal and will never end. Somebody asked me about this on Wednesday. This is one of the major reasons. Some of, some of you have been taught replacement theology. Replacement theology is not biblical because if it is, then God broke his promise and his word is not true. But we know that's not the case. 